My pleasure to introduce Larry, our friend. Uh, Shirley and I actually introduced him to the Collectors Club. And I think Larry's been a great <laughs> asset to the club. So Larry's speaking tonight on Canada's Special Delivery Mail Service, 1898 to, to 1951. And he's going to put special emphasis on Canada's Special Delivery Stamp of 1927. I understand this is a very special stamp because the workmanship in producing this stamp is absolutely outstanding. Larry has an interest in, it has, has, it has had an interest in stamps since he was very young. I think he started as early as age six. And he, uh, <laughs> like many young collectors, he's very idealistic and thought he'd like to collect absolutely every stamp. But he uh, realized before too long that that wasn't going to happen. So Larry decided to specialize in Canadian stamps. And I guess you have a pretty extensive uh, collection of Canadian stamps. Um, Larry also collects pressed glass. And he has a very nice collection of Victorian goblets. He collects bunnikins, marbles, postcards, and Hawaiian bottles. So, um, Larry? Thank you, Walter. So this uh, slide just summarizes uh, uh, what I'll be talking about. Um, Canada Special Delivery Mail Service, uh, 1898 to 1951. And that's just the period of time that Canada used uh, special delivery stamps. And uh, then I'll have a couple of slides um, showing the special delivery stamps. And then most of the talk will be about uh, Canada's special delivery stamp of 1927. And I'll talk about the design of the stamp, uh, line engraved stamp printing, which was the method used to print it, and the method used to print the all of Canada's stamps up to the 1960s. And then finally, I'll just uh, talk about some of the stamps and covers that I brought out. So highlights of Canada's Special Delivery Mail Service. The Special Delivery Mail Service was introduced in 14 cities in 1898. And by using a special delivery stamp of 10 cents, in addition to ordinary postage, letters mailed at any money order post office in Canada could obtain special delivery service in any of the cities providing the service. And delivery of special delivery mail was made by special messenger. And Regular letter carriers weren't normally used as it would take too long for delivery if they took it out on their route. <laughs> and init initially, the special messengers were paid uh, eight cents for each delivery. And the maximum that they were allowed to make in a month was $25. And so I think the post office was being pretty generous because the service cost 10 cents and they were giving eight of it to the, to the messenger. In 1907, the service expanded to 24 cities, including Calgary and Edmonton, and by 1950, there were about 100 locations providing the service. Initially, hours of operation for the service were 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., except on Sundays. And by, 19, by the 1920s, uh, some locations were providing limited Sunday service, and by 1936, Sunday service was provided at all locations and service was also provided on holidays. Before the provision of Sunday service, uh, some of the locations, the post office would be good enough to call you up and let you know that they have a special delivery mail for you that you could go in and pick up. And in 1923, uh, Canada and the US implemented an agreement recognizing the other country's special delivery stamps. And a similar arrangement was made with the UK and 1947, although the UK never actually had special delivery stamps, their regular stamps could be used to obtain special delivery in Canada. So prior to these agreements, and on mail originating in other countries, if special delivery was required in Canada, then a Canadian special delivery stamp would need to be used. So if you were um, you know, wanting to send a letter to Canada from these other countries, and you'd have to carry it. And have it delivered special delivery, you'd have to carry the Canadian special delivery stamps with you. 
Another arrangement uh, worth mentioning was an agreement between Canada and the Bahamas made in 1916, in which they exchanged 600 of each other's special <laughs> delivery stamps, and the Bahamas prepared uh, a five pence stamp specially for this. But unfortunately, most of the stamps in Canada received were purchased by collectors, and most of the Canadian stamps sent to the Bahamas ended up being stuck together. <laughs> so the arrangement was eventually terminated. It just, just didn't go too well. And another uh, ruling was that special delivery stamps were not to be used in payment of regular postage or registration, but beginning in 1907 it was okay to use regular stamps to prepay for domestic special delivery, as long as the word special delivery were written in the up top left corner of the item. Not surprisingly, there's lots of examples where the stamps have been used incorrectly. In 1938, the service was expanded to include parcel post within Canada. In, in 1921, the fee for special delivery was increased from 10 cents to 20 cents, as the service wasn't paying for itself, then lowered uh, to 10 cents again in 1939 to encourage the use of airmail. In 1951, the use of special delivery stamps was discontinued due to the relatively small use. And regular postage stamps were used to be were to be used with the use of special delivery labels for writing the word special delivery on the item. So yeah, that's just a summary of the, of the service, and I should mention that uh, most of the information I've just mentioned is from a, a book on special delivery um, compiled by G. H. Davis in 1991. So the next couple of slides, I'm just uh, going to speak a little bit about the stamps. And that um, first stamp in 1898 uh, was used right through to 1921, and it was um, those first two stamps were printed by the American Banknote Company, and uh, and sometime in the 1920s they um, uh, reorganized and created the Canadian Banknote Company, which printed the 1927 stamp that I'll be speaking about later. Uh, in 1930, the British American Banknote Company won the contract to print um, Canada stamps. And uh, then in 1932, that stamp was modified. They took off the 20 to accommodate uh, bilingualism. And then in 1935, uh, the Canadian Banknote Company got the contract back again. And uh, that stamp in 35 and 1938 um, were just issued in conjunction with uh, other regular <coughs> issues, some new issues. And then in 1939, when the um, rate was uh, reduced, um, they surcharged the 20 cent stamp just to use up supplies until they had the, uh, the 10 cent stamp. And then those two stamps, 1942 and 1946, uh, were just issued in conjunction with um, two other uh, issues, the, uh, the war and the peace issue that they're called by collectors. And those, those last four stamps are um, special delivery airmail stamps, and um, that, uh, that made good sense um, because if you uh, it combined the airmail and the special delivery rate, and so that made good sense to have <coughs> such a stamp because there's going to send if you're wanting to have something uh, use the special delivery, then you obviously want to have it sent airmail where that was possible. So the rest of the talk will be mostly on the special delivery stamp of 1927. And just to put the stamp into context, it was one of six stamps issued June the 29th, 1927, to commemorate the 60th anniversary of Confederation. And um, just mention that a new stamp in those days was quite a significant event because other than a single stamp issued in 1917 for the 50th anniversary of Confederation, it was the first commemorative issue since the Quebec Tercentenary issue in 1908. And this issue is often considered to be the first that's truly bilingual, and the special delivery stamp was Canada's only special delivery commemorative stamp. And also on that same day in 1927, they issued three other stamps, 
uh, known as the historical issue to collectors. And uh, in, in 1911, after King George V came to the thrill, the post office issued stamps showing the king in his admiral uniform, and that design was used as the regular issue stamp till 1928. So as far as issuing stamps, it was quite a different situation than what we've seen the post office doing in recent years. So. Um, the stamp depicts uh, five modes of mail transportation, including two biplanes, a train, dog sled, a ship liner, and a courier on a horse. It was designed by Herman Schwartz of the Canadian Banknote Company, who designed many of Canada's stamps, including the well-known blue stamp of 19, blue no stamp of 1928. The image was engraved by the American Banknote Company in New York, its parent company at the time, and printed by the Canadian Banknote Company, utilizing the line engraved method of printing. The National Archives have some essays showing proposed designs for the stamp, and the image on the right it's just a blow up that I've made of ones on the left. And you see that first effort uh, didn't make any reference to confederation. And then in figure two, they've, um, the reference to confederation has been added in. And then in um, figure three, the, the ocean liner and the mail courier on the horse have been added. And then in the final design, figure four, they've put in some trees uh, down at the bottom. And the excellent detail of the engraving is illustrated in that the mail bag on the horse bears the words Canada PO. And um, you know, I need about a 10 power magnifying glass to see it, but it's, it's actually there. <laughs> it's, uh... So I next want to uh, talk about line engraved printing, which was the method used to print the stamp it's also sometimes known as steel line engraved and tagli or recess printing. And all of Canada's postage stamps up to the 1960s utilized the line engraved method of printing. Uh, there was a couple of stamps where it was utilized in conjunction with other printing methods, and it was the, the method used, I think, uh, print the stamps of many, many other countries. So the method of line engraved printing originated in the late 1700s. And in the early 1800s, an American inventor, Jacob Perkins, had a number of innovations advancing its technology, including improved methods of softening and hardening steel and the invention of the transfer roll and press. His innovations enabled the printing of substantially more impressions from a, a plate than had previously been possible, and he was really credited with revolutionizing the whole process of printing. As it was the best process for preventing counterfeiting, it was used for printing stamps, bank notes, and other items where security was essential. And the British had, had quite a problem with uh, counterfeiting of their bank notes, uh, convinced Perkins to move to England, where he and his associates were able to make a bank note that at the time was considered to be unforgeable. And then years later, in 1846, Forty in England, it was Perkins. It was a Perkins patented printing press that printed the world's first uh, postage stamps. And he must have been quite a genius because, in addition to his inventions to do with engraving and printing, he's known for a number of other inventions. One of them having the first patent on the refrigerator. So the process begins with engraving a master die, in which the design is recess engraved in reverse on a small square of soft steel, about four inches square using engraving tools. And in my example here, that's um, it's actually a British stamp. And the design is reversed because on the British stamps, the queen is always facing to the left. Uh, so you can see that she's facing to the right there. And so for the master die, uh, a small number of die proofs showing a single impression of the stamp are made to ensure satisfaction with the engraving quality of impression and color. And 
So that's a, it's a die proof of the stamp. And they did these on India paper because it's uh, India paper is very thin and apparently shows the, the best impression. And upon approval of the master die, it's hardened and a small number of impressions are transferred to a roller of soft steel about six inches in diameter. And then the roller is hardened and usually anywhere from 50 to 400 impressions impressions are transferred to a printing plate of soft steel using a transfer press. And each impression has to be an exact duplicate of the master die. And ink is rolled into the plate. The surface of white leaving ink in the recesses. A sheet of stamp paper is placed in the printing press with the pressure of the press forcing the paper into the ink recesses of the plate. And after each impression, that same process is repeated. Then once satisfied with proofs from the printing plate, the plate is hardened and faced with chromium and is now ready for production. And then once in production, the sheets of stamps are perforated, they cut into panes for eventual distribution to post offices. And that's a, a proof sheet of 200 of the 1927 stamp that's uh, it's in the National Archives. So next I'm just going to speak about a few of the stamps I've brought out, um, some of the ones you might call like the oddball items. And um, these are imperfect and part perfect uh, stamps that are considered to be favor stamps. And based on articles written in the 1950s, it's thought that a postal official made a supply of these available to a collector in exchange for 19th century Canadian stamps that the post office wanted for their archives. And the philatelic literature contains various versions as to who was involved and what transpired, but uh, we do know that they're, they're not printing errors and they were certainly never sold at post offices. And these will be found on the other stamps of the issue too, and also on the, um, the uh, regular issue set of 1928. This next one, it's a Universal Postal Union specimen uh, that's from the Madagascar Postal Archives. And um, the Universal Postal Union uh, was established in 1874 with headquarters in Bern, Switzerland, and Canada joined in 1878. And its purpose was to coordinate postal policies between member nations, including rates, numeral values, and the colors of stamps. When member countries issued new stamps, they were required to send examples to the UPU in Bern, which would distribute the stamps to member nations. And then several years ago, Madagascar uh, sold stamps from its archives, resulting in these coming on the market. And um, yeah, so it just makes for an interesting corollary item to a collection. So uh, in this stamp, you can see that it has holes in it, and usually that's not a very good thing, but in this case, it's, it's, uh, it's okay, because governments and companies would have these made to discourage the theft of their stamps. And so this is a Metropolitan Life Insurance Company uh, person. And um, yeah, so um, when companies and business started using metered mail, then these, these weren't, weren't necessary any longer. So in the final part of my talk, I'll we'll, we'll talk about some of the covers I've brought. And um, all the covers have the special 20 cent special delivery stamp on them, but all have a, a little different story to tell. And I'll, uh, I'll, make, the, uh, I'll make it a short story. Um, this, this first one is a registered special delivery uh, first day of issue cover. And um, an example of what they call a drop letter, because it's a letter mailed at a post office for delivery in the same area that the post office serves. So you can see it's been uh, canceled at 3 p.m. on both the front and the back side. 
And uh, well, first day cover collecting used to be quite, quite popular, but um, maybe not so much anymore. So this this next one was um, a letter going from Hamilton, Ontario, to uh, New York City, addressed um, to the Commodore Hotel. This is one of my favorite covers. It's um, it illustrates the acceptance in the U.S. of the Canadian special delivery stamp, and I think also the efficiency of the service, at least in New York City. It, it was mailed um, on October 26, 1927, and that black circular cancel, I don't know, you may not be able to make it out, but it's a New York arrival cancels at um, 11 a.m. the following morning. And this was, you know, prior to any regular airmail service uh, in, in Canada. And then the two hand stamps on the back show uh, arrival on the 20th floor of the uh, Commodore Hotel at 11.19 a.m., only 19 minutes later. So the uh, the service, at least in New York, seemed to be working pretty well. So this next cover is mailed um, in Winnipeg on December the 2nd, 1944, uh, to Louisiana, where it arrived on December the 4th. And um, it was sent by uh, Casimir Belaski was quite a well-known uh, Winnipeg stamp dealer, so its contents were probably stamps. And I just wanted to uh, show you this one because it illustrates uh, the variety of services that were available at the time, including airmail, registration, special delivery, and acknowledgement of receipt. And so the cover has the, the total correct postage of 37 cents on it um, for all those services. and. Uh, but the, it was actually used, uh, an incorrect use of the special delivery stamp because the, the rate had been reduced to uh, 10 cents in 1939, so he should have really been using a 10 cent stamp, but that's okay. <laughs> so this uh, next one, it's a Regina to Winnipeg experimental uh, flight cover. And before there was regular airmail service in Canada, established in 1928, there were many experimental flights that took place that carried mail. And for about three weeks in December of 1928, experimental flights were carried out <coughs> from the Prairie Provinces to test the feasibility of regular airmail air service. And this cover relates to the, uh, the flight uh, leg from Regina to Winnipeg on December the 10th, 1928. And in addition to the Regina and Winnipeg cancels, it's back stamped with the Regina and Moose Jaw Railroad Post Office cancel. And so it would have gone to Winnipeg and then it came back that same day on the train. And it's what we call a philatelic cover because it, uh, it doesn't, the postage on there doesn't uh, relate to what the, the real rate should have been. So somebody's just put all the steps from the set on it and it's, uh, he's probably sending it to himself. But that's the uh, first flight and experimental flight coverage. Is, it's another area of collecting. And, uh, it need not be very expensive. So the last, the last cover that I made a slide of is, um, is a letter mailed in Toronto on December the 19th, 1927 to New Westminster, BC, utilizing US airmail service. So you can see there's a United States airmail stamp on it. And it illustrates an arrangement Canada had with the U.S. prior to uh, regular airmail <coughs> service in Canada, in which uh, airmail routes in the U.S. were made available to Canadians for an extra 10 cents per half ounce. So U.S. airmail stamps were sold in various post offices in Canada, mostly in cities close to the U.S. border. And, um, <laughs> Only the Canadian stamps were to be cancelled in Canada, and in this example, the American stamp has a, a Chicago cancel. And the sender of this letter probably wasn't too happy with the service because it took nine days to get there. And it, it, so it, it could have gone on the train from Toronto in well, three days. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't know, this was in the winter, so maybe there was a problem with the rail lines and 
know, something happened to it after it got to Chicago, and maybe the planes couldn't fly because of weather. So, yeah, who, who knows? Um, could have been, could have been anything. Yeah. So that's um, that's about it. <laughs> so if anybody's got any questions. Uh, <clears throat> oh, Tim. <yeah>, sorry. <laughs> Larry, on that last uh, <coughs> uh, yeah. cover mm -hmm. that you had up, right? Is it the two cent stack was the regular postage? Right. Mm -hmm. And then the air mail and the special delivery. And the special delivery. That's right. Yeah. So special delivery wouldn't it wouldn't necessarily go by air mail? No, not necessarily. Like special delivery just relates to when the item gets to the, the location where it's to be delivered. Yeah, so like air mail or whether it goes by train is another. Uh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. <laughs>